Welcome everyone to today's Sabbath service. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, we are Saved by Truth Ministry. I'm Stephen Gregg, and I'm, I lead this ministry. And we have a worldwide ministry all over the world in multiple countries on, I think, probably almost every continent by now. It's pretty awesome how God is just moving and, and expanding the, the body of Christ. And so I'm excited that you're here today, here, all the brothers here on Zoom with us. And then we have a bunch of people on Facebook. Uh, we're right now streaming in eight different groups on Facebook. So it's really exciting to see that. Uh, this is our website, savedbytruth.com. You can go check out our website and look at all the different ministries that we have, and, and it'll be growing and expanding on the website here shortly as well. Um, in addition to that, I want to show you what you can do as well, because one of the things that we're doing as a body, we are expanding the body of Christ, and we are looking for pastors. We're looking for leaders. We're looking for people that teach the word of God um, to learn this message. And we're, we're teaching the message of the kingdom of God, and we're sharing it with people. And we would love for you to join with us and be able to share this message. And I use a tool called Livestream Everywhere. I just wanted to share that with you. You can register and use it for free. It's a free service that you can go and use and start broadcasting your message out to the world. And I use this so that you guys can actually have it for yourself. And that's why I'm sharing it now on our Sabbath service so that pastors and people that, that teach the word of God can get this service and use it and spread the word of God. This is what we do to spread it um, you know, to different people and different places all around the world. So I just want to let you guys know about that. You can go ahead and, and use that for free. And so also I want to let you know about some of the videos and some of the other things that we have for you as well. One of the big things that we do every single week is we teach about the Lord's Sabbath day because um, we're going to be going through a lesson today, and the lesson today is called The Two Witnesses of Revelation, and we're going to be talking about that in detail so you can know who the two witnesses are, or at least start to get a concept, because we don't have all the details of it. God has not revealed everything, but it's important to know about these two witnesses. They're in Scripture, and so we're going to talk about that, but first, I want to give you a few other things that you can do for yourself and for your ministry. One of them is you can download these different videos. I would recommend take a screenshot of this or you can just write down the domains. The first one is www.bit.ly forward slash making disciples workbook. I would recommend you to download that workbook. That has all the scriptures it takes to take a person that doesn't know anything about the Bible, that doesn't know anything about Jesus, take them and walk them through the process of learning how to become a disciple of Jesus, getting baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, being added to the body of Christ, learning the Sabbath day and the commandments and how to honor the Lord so they can make it to the kingdom of God. So I would recommend you to download that workbook, go through it yourself, and then teach that to others and share it with your congregation, share it with your people. The next thing you can do is go to bit.ly forward slash truth about baptism. That one teaches specifically about baptism because that's a big deception a lot of people don't know or understand. I'd recommend you to watch that video, write down the scriptures, and look and see what the Bible says about that. The third one is bit.ly forward slash the Lord's Sabbath day. That one teaches you how the Sabbath day works because the Lord has been revealing that to us. And we've been teaching that around the world. And as soon as people learn about the Sabbath and they learn about baptism, it's amazing. God opens their eyes to so much more in the scriptures. The third thing, the fourth one is the, the Lord's Ten Commandments. So it's bit.ly forward slash the Lord's Ten Commandments. That one is the same thing about the Ten Commandments. When a person starts honoring the Ten Commandments, that's the covenant of the Lord, and they'll see why it's mandatory to make it to the kingdom of God to know those. The next thing is few are chosen. So bit.ly forward slash few are chosen. Um, that one's a very powerful message to show you why the 144,000 are chosen and who they are. So you can um, hopefully become one of them. The next thing is bit.ly forward slash 2021 Pentecost. That teaches you the six marks of God, and which will show you what the mark of the beast is and how it all is coming together right now in these days. Uh, we are the Church of Philadelphia, and we recommend you to, like I said, take a screenshot of this, learn it, share it with your friends, family, and congregations as well. Um, so this is how we find the true Sabbath day. We go over this every week. And the reason we go over it every week is because people new are watching this video. And it's amazing how many pastors and how many people around the world see the video, that God opens their mind, they see it, they understand it, and they start honoring it. So here's how it works. It's very simple. The Lord's calendar looks like this. At the beginning, it was dark. And they had a thing called a new moon. Genesis 1, he made a new moon and a new sun on the first day. And then that was that first day was called the new moon celebration. 
And then at that time, they just started to count two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the seventh day is a half a moon. That's how it was. There was no Pope Gregory. So there was no Gregorian calendar like we live today. They went by the sun, moon, and stars, just like it says in Genesis 1, verse 14. And then eighth day, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Fourteenth day is a half a moon. I'm, I'm sorry, a full moon, just like it is every single month. It's a full moon on the 14th day. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And then it's a half a moon the other direction. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. And then it's a, a, a either a sliver or a dark moon. And then the process starts all over. We go back out and look for the new moon. Every single month, we've been doing this for years. And that's how God's calendar works. And we can show you one of the videos that I show, told you to watch about the Sabbath. You'll see all the scriptures that prove 100% this is true. So let me just help you with something. Saturday is not the Sabbath day. Friday night to Saturday night is not the Sabbath day. Um, Sundays are not the Sabbath day. And you can't just make up any day to be the Sabbath day. This is how God did it. He blessed one day, and it was called the seventh day. And you can read about that in Genesis 2, verse 1. So God wanted me to share that with you. And so here's the reason why you need to know this. John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. They replied, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoke about was his body. And after he, he was raised from the dead... His disciples recalled what he said, then they believed the scriptures and the words Jesus had spoken. So this is very important. This is a prophetic thing. And today, you're going to start learning prophecy. We're going to be starting talking about different types of prophecies, and you got to learn to have your mind open for prophecy. It's not just black and white like we think it is. He said he was going to destroy the temple in three days. See, the people had their carnal mind thinking that they're going to destroy this big brick building temple and build it in three days. It took 46 years to build. No, he was talking about his body. Initially, he was talking about his body. But you're going to see in a minute, he was actually talking about the body of Christ, which is what he's talking about. Because it's going to be destroyed for two days, and then on the third day, it was going to be raised, just as he did in the grave. Very important to understand. So this is what he was talking about here. Let's look. So from Jesus' birth up until 99 years, 999 years, that was the first day. So the, the body of Christ was destroyed by the Vatican, by the Romans. It was destroyed. It was dispersed all around. The Israelites were dispersed all over the world. The Hebrew Israelites were brought to the Americas at some point. So, you know, those 999 years, <clears throat> the body of Christ was destroyed, just as he said it was. He was in the grave that first year, the first day. And then the next thousand to 999 years, that's the second day. So those years, that's when the Vatican took over and started infiltrating in all the churches. And the body of Christ, again, was destroyed for the second day. And Jesus was in the grave for two days. But the body of Christ was destroyed for two days. But guess what happened in the year 2000? <clears throat> God said he's going to raise his body back in the third day. And so that time, the body of Christ, baptized disciples, got together, the Israelites and the Gentiles, where he said there is no difference anymore, got together. And they started building the body of Christ. The Lord started building it through them. And from 2000 to 3000 would be the third day. So you're going to see in a minute, during that, from 2000 till now, 2021, God's been building his body of Christ. <clears throat> and so it looks like this. Now, here's the whole lineage of years and why honoring the Sabbath is so important. From Adam to Noah was the first day. That's about a thousand years. From Noah to Abraham was the second day. That's about 2,000 years. From Abraham to David was about 3,000 years. From David to Jesus was 4,000 years. That's the fourth day. From, David, from Jesus to 99 years was the fifth day. From, Jesus, from 1,000 to 1,099 is the sixth day. See, we've been honoring the Lord for 6,000 years. The Bible says a day is like 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is like a day. So we've been honoring the Lord for 6,000 years. But he says on the seventh day, we rest which is from 2000 to 3000. And that's why he's now building his body. And soon when the people are gone and we're taken to the kingdom of God and we have the new heaven and new earth, we're going to reign for a thousand years. That's why it's so important to know what the Sabbath means and how it works and how to, and why we're supposed to be honoring it. So here's the beginning of the third day. So you can see it really quick. 2000, everything begins in the month of Passover. 
Just understand that. Passover is when Jesus died. He died on Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he rose on first fruit. So that's when it all begins, Passover. So Passover 2001 was year one, year two, year three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Obama was elected, and there's some big things that happened with Obama. We have a video that you can go watch that video. It's called The Man of Sin Revealed. So bit.ly forward slash The Man of Sin Revealed. You can go watch that video, learn all about Obama and how he plays into this. 2009 is Revelation 1. Revelation 2, 2010. 2011, Revelation 3. Revelation 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 2019, wow. 2019, God just revealed something to me just now that I just didn't understand. He just showed it to me. 2020 20 is Revelation 12. 2021 is Revelation 13. Revelation 22 is Revelation is 14, 2014. 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And this is the, the world right now is talking about a thing called Agenda 30, Agenda 2030. When they're talking about a new earth and all this stuff. Well, guess what? God's going to have a new heaven and a new earth exactly at the same time. See, Satan always tries to do the opposite of what Jesus is doing and what God is doing. And so I just want you to see this chart so you can understand Revelation 14 is when the 144,000 are taken to God. Now, we don't know if 100% of this is accurate. Don't know. But this is what I do know. The Lord revealed this to us. We've been honoring it. And so far, it's playing out exactly as it says in the scripture. Because the mark of the beast is here. That little thing that people are getting and put in their arm and all the stuff that's going into their body and, you know, people, you know all that. If, you, if you've been through with our ministry, you kind of know what we're talking about. There's a lot of things that's happened at the mark of the beast. You're not going to be able to buy or sell unless you take this mark. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. So all of that is happening in Revelation 13 and Revelation 14 is coming very, very soon. <clears throat> but today we're going to talk about what it talked about in Revelation 11. Today's message is the two witnesses of Revelation. So we're going to look at the scriptures on that. We're going to look at some scriptures on the two witnesses of Revelation. So we're going to go to BibleGateway.com. I look at Bible Gateway, and that's the, the, the way I like to study the scriptures, because I can see the Bible in multiple translations. <clears throat> so who are the two witnesses? Well, we don't know exactly. But what we're going to do today is just look at some scripture and we're going to look at some prophecy. That's what we're going to be going through today is prophecy in the scripture. So you can kind of see how things work and see what the Bible reveals to each of us. So let's look. We're going to start with Acts. We're going to Acts. Get you look at start writing. Acts 2. Acts 2, starting in verse 17. It says, in the last days, let me make the screen a little bit bigger. It says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughter will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So the first group of people he sent out his spirit on. Now, you got to remember, this is not, he's not giving every single person on earth the Holy Spirit. That's not what this means. He's talking about the spirit of prophecy. In the Bible, there's multiple spirits that God has for different things. And this one is the spirit of prophecy. He's talking about on all people. So he's giving people around the world the ability to prophesy about what's about to happen. And as you'll go on YouTube, you go on Facebook, you'll see people talking about different things. Or maybe God showed them a piece of something. Maybe they had a dream at night and, and God's revealing some things to them. So the first thing you got to understand is that he gave his spirit to people to prophesy. So that's the true thing. That's what the Bible says. But the second thing is what I want you to really, really see. It says, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So now on the true disciples of Jesus. Baptized disciples that honor his commandments and, and keep his covenant, those types of people will actually, he's going to pour out his spirit also. <clears throat> and they're going to prophesy too. It says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and bills of smoke. Uh, I think those are volcanoes. 
and the fires and stuff that's going on right now. Because that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like you know fires and billows of smoke. That's what's happening all around the world right now at one of the highest rates in history. So the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it talks about calling on the name of the Lord. And, and we can read about that and what that actually means. But if you read Revelation, calling on the name of the Lord is more than just calling on his name and you'll be saved. There's more to it, but that's not the message today. You can watch our videos about baptism and how that works. But the bottom line is I wanted you to see, the Lord wanted you to see that there's people going to be prophesying in the last days. And that's kind of what today's message is about. It's about prophecy. And that's what we're going to be looking at is the two witnesses prophecy. So let's look over at Matthew. Because everyone that hears this message is not going to understand the message. Go to Matthew 13. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to really start praying for yourself to be able to really understand this message. Because everyone's not going to understand the message. This message is going to go over some people's head. Some people are going to doubt what they hear and what they read. And that's okay, because there's a reason it happens. This is called the parable of the sower. We're not going to read the whole thing. You can read it for yourself. You can start at one and just keep reading. But at, after he starts talking about the parable of the sower and how the different seeds fall on different people, one of them, the birds come and take them, and one of them, he gets snatched away by the evil one and stuff like that. You can read about that. But then in verse 10, this is Acts, I'm sorry, this is Matthew 13, verse 10, it says, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. So that's the first thing that the Lord wanted me to share with you, <clears throat> is that the knowledge of the secrets of heaven has been given to you. Now, who are you? Who, who would you be? Well, you got to remember, he's talking to his disciples that are right there with him. So today, those would be baptized disciples that are keeping his commandments of God or that, you know, that are honoring him that may not know about the, king, the commandments of God, that, may, that are honoring him by heart. God looks at the heart, not just the actions. So that would be the people that he would be teaching this message to. Is that the secrets, they're not for everyone. Secrets are hidden. They're not for everyone to know about. So it says the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. If you notice, it doesn't say the secrets about me. In other words, Jesus. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say the secrets about baptism. He doesn't say the secrets about, you know, living a great life and, and read, reading the Bible. He doesn't say that. It's very specific what he's talking about. He says the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you and not to them. So that's the first thing is. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to his disciples that are keeping the commandments of God and have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. The second thing is to not to them. Who's them? That would be virtually everyone else that have not. So it's very important to understand this. The next thing it says is, keep reading. Um, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So in other words, even if they have a little bit, if they're not going to honor the Lord, it's going to be taken from them at some point, their knowledge that they do have. Then it says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Now the Lord is going to tell us why he speaks to people in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. In other words, they might see here. They might be sitting here in this message, listening to this out of the day. They might be watching it online on, on Facebook. They might be hearing the message, but you know what they're saying? Ah, uh, yeah, right. That guy's hogwash. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not true. You know, oh, I don't, I don't really want to be here. Anything could be there. It could be in your heart. So they might be seeing here, but they're not hearing it. They're not hearing the message. Look what it says. In them fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be seeing, but never perceiving. Here's why. Look what it says. For the people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Those are the reasons why they can't see it. Their hearts become calloused. Let me explain what a calloused heart looks like. It means their heart is hard. They have a hard heart towards the Lord, and usually that's because of sin. Usually. They've done some sin in the dark. They're in the dark in their life, 
They have darkness in their life. And because they have darkness, they're not in the light. And usually that's one of the things that causes a callous heart. The second reason why they may have a callous heart is because they don't believe in the Lord. They, they might know about the Lord. They may think of them like the Lord, but they don't really have faith in the Lord. They don't really trust in the Lord. The Lord is not their Lord. It's just something that they have to do or they do. You understand? So they're seeing, they're not perceiving the information. Their hearts have become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They barely hear the message and they have closed their own eyes. In other words, they're not even paying attention in this message. They're not paying attention. They're not paying attention. Even while we're going through the scripture right now, they're probably not even paying attention. Here's why. Because they don't want to know the, the truth. Look what it says. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I will heal them. Here's the key, though. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear. Okay. So, in other words, a lot of the people in the Bible, all the people in the Bible, they would love to have heard this message. But it's so sad that so many people here in, in on, on earth today don't really want to hear the truth. And so that's why the Lord, you know, reveals this message. So if you're not getting this message, if this message, you can't get it. If you don't understand it, if it's not important to you, if, if it's not making sense to you, you might want to check your heart to see if your heart is callous. Okay. So this is very important. So let's talk about really quick, what are the, some of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven you've learned? And then we're going to go through a couple more scriptures, because this is more of a teaching message, not more of a preaching message. So I just like to go over the beginning part, because people want me to know where their heart is. They need to check their own heart. But let's look at what you have learned. Number one, Say by truth ministry, you've learned that you must become a baptized disciple in Jesus, not a Christian. In other words, you need to repent, be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and be added to the body of Christ. And you can read about that in Matthew 8, 28, verses 18 through 20. Or you can read it in Acts 2, verse 38 through 41. Or you can read it in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13. So the first secret of the kingdom of heaven, that's been a secret because it's deceived all around the world, is that you have to become a baptized disciple to make it to the kingdom of heaven. That's one secret of the kingdom. Now to you, you're like, yes, dude, of course, that's obvious. No, it's not obvious. I deal with people all the time that don't understand this and don't believe that. They think it's an outward sign of inward grace. They think it's something you do after you're saved, which is not true. The second secret of the kingdom of heaven you've learned is how the true Sabbath day works. You've all learned how the true Sabbath day works. In other words, you know that at the end of every month, we go out and spot the new moon. And then the next morning is the first day, and you count seven days. You know that because you've been honoring it. And to you, like I said, every message I go through that, and to you, you're thinking, come on, Stephen, we, we do this every week. Yeah, I know we do it every week, but you got to understand, to everyone else, it's revolutionary. To people that are watching on Facebook that's never heard this before, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, I've been taught Saturday is the Sabbath. Yeah, but if you look in the scriptures, there's not a single word anywhere in the Bible, the word Saturday. It's called the seventh day. The only way you can know the seventh day, you got to know the first day. And the Bible calls the first day of the month, the new moon celebration. And you can read about that in 1 Samuel 20, verse 24 through 27. See, the new moon celebration starts the month. And then we count to seven. And that's how it was in the Bible, because there was no Saturday in the scripture. Some people think online, you know, I think the Sabbath is on Friday night to Saturday night. Because that's what the people that call themselves Jews do. Yeah, but the people that call themselves Jews are the same people that killed Jesus. They're the ones who made up the deception. And you can read about that in Matthew 28, verse 10 and 11. You can see they are still deceiving people to this very day. And it says so in the scripture. So you got to understand the Sabbath day is one of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven that you've learned. Another one is keeping the Ten Commandments is mandatory to make it to the kingdom of God. And you can read about that in Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17. 
Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17. That's a commandment that the Lord said. If you want to enter the kingdom of life, you want to enter life, keep the commandments. He made it really simple. It's not like ambiguous or anything. It's really good. And then they said, well, which ones? And he started rattling off a few of them. So, you know, this is to us, again, this is so simple. Of course it is. It's a covenant between God and his people. It was their protection for all those years. But now people think, oh, you don't need to honor the commandments. That's the law of Moses. No, it's not. It's the commandments of God. And so that's another secret of the kingdom of God that you know. Another secret of the kingdom of God is keeping the Lord's holy days are the marks of the Lord. In other words, it marks us. It separates us. It signifies who we are. See, there's a lot of people today that call themselves believers or call themselves Christian that are going to go celebrate Halloween next week. They're going to go celebrate a demonic day. They're going to put on demonic outfits or go to houses with demonic stuff all around them. They're all around our neighborhood. They're going to be doing this all around the world and then calling themselves a believer of Jesus. Imagine if Jesus was right there with them. Would they be doing it then? No. Why not? Because it's a demonic day. It doesn't make sense. But see, believers think it's okay to do, oh, it's no big deal. It's just fun. No, it's not. It's demonic. It's not of God. You see, we know the Lord's holy days. You know, we know Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruit, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Pentecost, Feast of, uh, you know, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. We know the Lord's feasts, and we honor them, and we love to honor them. You see, that's who the Lord knows, because they're marked. They understand the meaning of them, and that's who the Lord is coming to get. And you can watch that video. There's a video, because it's kind of too hard to give you just one or two scriptures, Here's a video that I did. It's called www.bit.ly forward slash 2021 Pentecost. It goes over those two marks of the Lord. So those are the secrets of the kingdom of God. And I have a video on each one of those that you guys can actually take those videos and you can share them and spread them as much as you want. But today the Lord is going to give you even more because he says with, you know, those who have will be given more. So today, the Lord wants to give you a little bit more, because last night I was up, and he was just starting to talk to me about these two witnesses, and then someone sent me a video about the two witnesses, I watched them, and he gave some ideas and some concepts, but they weren't, they, some of them were a little bit inaccurate, because of who they think the people that call themselves Jews are, and things like that. So the Lord says, Stephen, now you need to teach a little bit about um, the two witnesses, and some of the qualities of these two witnesses. So then, Whoever has eyes to see and ears to hear, let the Lord reveal to you who the two witnesses are. Because I'm not going to say who the two witnesses are. What I'm going to do is just show you what the scripture says, and then the Lord hopefully will open your eyes and ears. So we're going to start reading in Revelation 11. This is actually is something that I, I see in scripture. A lot of people are trying to figure this out, who, this, who these um Two witnesses are. And same thing with me. I didn't even know. I never even looked at it. I never really paid attention to it till last night. So let's look and see what the Bible says about this. Two witnesses. This is Revelation 11, starting in verse 1. I'm going to write that scripture down. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with his worshipers. Okay, so that's the first thing. So we're going to break this down piece by piece. The first thing that the Lord was telling them to do was to go measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshipers. Well, how do you measure the temple of God, the altar, and its worshipers? Well, how do you measure the worshipers? Well, you have to do that by number then. You can't do it by distance. You can't do it by weight. You have to do it by how many there are. That's what God revealed to me today. So he wants to know how many worships that worshipers there are that are the temple of God. So I said, well, God, who are the temple of God? Well, let's look. BibleGateway.com. So we're going to look at BibleGateway.com and see who the temple of God are. First Corinthians. First Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. It says, 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, 
I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the first thing we got to understand is that the foundation of the house of God has to be built on Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. He's the cornerstone of the building, okay, of the temple of God. Remember back in the day they had temples and the people that called themselves Jews think they're building the third temple? Well, they don't believe in Jesus, so that can't possibly be the temple. So that's the first thing. So here's what the temple of God is Jesus Christ. It says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones or wood or hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, capital D, the day of destruction, will bring it to light. So the first thing we have to understand is if anyone builds a foundation of gold, well, who does that? I'll tell you who, the Vatican. The people that call themselves Jews build their temples on costly stones. Matter of fact, they got this building that they're building right now, starting in 2022. It's actually three buildings. It's called Chrislam. The Muslim, the Jews, and the quote-unquote Christians are building these big three buildings in some country right now that they're all going to be one worship. They're making one world religion right now. Right now. Not, not next week, not next month, not next year. Right now it's happening. And they're building it with gold and all the stuff right there. You see, that's not God's temple. That's a man-made temple. And the Bible says the day. In other words, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the day it's talking about. The day, capital D, is the day of the Lord. In other words, the day, the 144,000 are gone, and all of a sudden, destruction starts to happen on earth. It's called the hour of trial. It says, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If wood has been built, survives, the builders will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escapes through the flames. In other words, they're going to have to go through some stuff. We talked about that, right? People are going to have to go through some stuff if they're worshiping in the wrong house. Let's keep reading. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. So now we know where God's temple is. God's temple are the baptized disciples that have the Spirit in them. The only way you get the Holy Spirit in you is through baptism. So now we know who God's temple is. So going back to Revelation 11, look what it says about the two witnesses. It says they will trample. It says, uh, wait, let me see here. It says, go and measure the temple of God. So he's measuring now how many baptized disciples are in the world. Guess what? The angels, the seven angels around the world, that's what they've been doing, going to find out where the baptized disciples are around the world. And it's worshipers, but exclude the outer courts. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. Okay, so I asked God, I said, God, what's the inner courts? Guess what the inner court is? The world. The rest of the world are the inner courts. See, we think that the inner courts would have something to do with Israel, the land over there. It has nothing to do with it. Because you gotta understand, you're either part of the temple of God or you're not. You're either a baptized disciple or not. There's only two groups of people. There's baptized disciples, and then there's everyone else who's not a baptized disciple. Those are the only two people. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about that many times. You either are a people of God, you either are not a people of God. You either have received mercy, or you either haven't received mercy. You're one of the two. So that temple court, the outer courts, are the ones that have been trampled by the Gentiles. Now, think about the world right now. Is the world being trampled by the Gentiles? Yes. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. So I was like, God... Wait a minute, wait a minute. This says the holy city. So what is this holy city then? What is that talking about? And God shared with me the holy city is the earth, because remember, he's going to create a new heaven 
and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So he's considering, because remember, this hasn't happened yet. I don't, I don't think all this has happened yet. I don't know yet still. I'm still learning. God's just revealing this to me. I'm just sharing what the Lord has revealed up to this point. I'm sure this may be a part two of this training, this Bible study as well. But what he's sharing is that the world right now is the holy city it's talking about. But it's not holy right now. It's going to be holy when he brings back the new heaven and the new earth. Also, remember, the new Jerusalem will be coming down on this holy city at that point, too. You can read about that in Revelation 12. I'm sorry, Revelation 21. So it says here, they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. So I'm asking the God, I'm asking the Lord, okay, so what does this mean? It says, and they will, the Gentiles will trample the Holy City for 42 months. Well, 42 months is three and a half years on God's calendar. Remember, God's calendar is not based on the Gregorian calendar. God's calendar is based on 360 days a year. Because each calendar month of God's calendar has only 30 days, not 31 and 28 and stuff like that, like, like this Gregorian calendar does. Every calendar has 30 days in God's calendar. So 42, 42 months equals exactly 360 days. I'm, I'm sorry, 180 days, which is half a year, six months. And then it says, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days in sackcloth. So I'm looking up 1260 days, and 1260 days is six months also. So it's going to be, they're going to be prophesying for six months, for, for six months, I'm sorry, for three and a half years. And I'm saying, what the heck is three and a half years? Three and a half years. By the way, the 42 months is not six months. The 42 months is three and a half years. I apologize on that. I overstepped on that one. So the 42 months is they're going to be trampling the Holy City for 42 months, which is exactly three and a half years. And the two witnesses are going to be prophesying for three and a half years and in sackcloth. I looked up and I Googled it. I went online. I went on Facebook. I went on um, you know, YouTube. I, I went on um, the Bible. And I said, what does it mean to be in sackcloth? Well, what it means is sackcloth to be mourning to be sorrowful for sin. And that's what, you know, I know my wife and I, we've been very sorrowful for sin, for the sin of the world. Every year we pray on the day of atonement for the entire world. And we've been doing this for 11 years. That's what it means to be in sackcloth. You know, we're not going to physically be in sackcloth, but the heart is sackcloth. The heart has the ashes on our forehead. We are praying and mourning for the people. Look what it says. They are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. So these are three biblical things we're going to look at of who these, um, these people are, these, um, these two witnesses are, because we're not 100% sure, because there's some things that God hasn't revealed yet, but we are going to look at these. Now, number one, it says there are two olive trees. And I was like, well, what does that mean to olive trees? Well, let's see what the Bible says about the olive trees. We're going to go to Romans. Write this down. Romans 11. So the first thing we know that these two witnesses are the two olive trees. Romans 11, and we're going to start in verse 11. Look what it says. In grafted branches. It says, again, I ask, did they stumble so fall? far to be beyond recovery. He's talking about the Israelites. The Israelites fell and you know, didn't obey God, didn't honor him. So he divorced the Israelites. And that's why they all dispersed. That's why they were enslaved on slave ships for 400 years and all that. So here he's asking a question. Again, did the, they, they stumble so far so to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgressions, in other words, their sin, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. So the reason Jesus came and died on the cross is to give everyone the opportunity to be saved. The Gentiles also, because before that, only the Israelites could be saved. They were the only ones that were the people of God. Everyone else didn't have that opportunity. Jesus died on the cross, was buried and resurrected. And then anyone who is baptized into Christ has now the opportunity to be saved. You can read about that in Galatians 3, verse 26 to 29, that it says, anyone who's baptized 
you're either Jew, Greek, slave, or free, or all one in Christ. You can read about that, like I said, in Galatians 3, verse 26 through 29. So this is what he's talking about here. It says, but if their transgressions, verse 12, means riches for the world, then their loss means riches for the Gentiles. How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, the Israelites, to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as, uh-oh, first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. See, it's interesting how it went right back to first fruit. See, we now know what he's talking about. If some of the branches have been broken off, in other words, some of the Israelites have been broken off, they're all over the place, they're thinking all these weird things and teaching all this false doctrine. It says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. He's talking to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, they've been broken off. They've been out there doing their own thing. The Bible calls them wild olive shoots. It says they've been grafted in to the Israelites, but they can't have the attitude that they're better than the Israelites or anyone else. It says, verse 19, you will then say branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. In other words, the Israelites that sinned, the ones that were put on slave ships and brought over to the Americas, the ones that have disobeyed God all around the world, you know, they were broken off by God because they disobeyed the commandments of God and didn't honor the Lord. So the Gentiles had the opportunity to be saved. And so it's very important to understand. And that's why everyone needs to be humble. The Israelites need to be humble and the Gentiles need to be humble. It says, verse 19, you will be, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Grafted, but they were broken off because, I'm sorry, granted, they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be ignorant. Ignorant. I'm sorry. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you. Provided, key, that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you are cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature are grafted in into cultivate, cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So what he's saying is the Israelites have the ability to be grafted back in, but they got to be humble. But guess what? The Gentiles have also the opportunity to not be grafted in if they're too prideful, if they're not honoring the Lord. And so it's very important to understand what happened here. This is why Jesus came. And so, again, if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you can understand that there's two olive trees. One is a Gentile. One is a true Israelite. That's who the two olive trees are. And if you notice, it's talking about a people. Very important. Gentile, Israelite. <clears throat> Very important who those two witnesses are. And they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. So let's look. I want to show you something. Go back to, um, we're going to go back to Revelation. Revelation. Uh, Revelation 1, because now we're going to see what the lamb stems are. Revelation 1. 
Revelation 1. We're going to go down to the bottom. You can read the whole thing. But I'm just going to show you what it says here at the bottom here. Revelation 1, verse 19, it says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mysteries of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand are the seven golden lampstands. Is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. So now we know something very important. The two witnesses, each one represents the church. Each one of the lampstands. We also know that the two witnesses are the lampstands. Okay? So that means they must be two separate churches. Or at least representing two separate churches. Because one is a Jew, one is or an Israelite, one is a Gentile. And they're representing two separate churches. Now, I don't know how the details are going to go from that. I don't know how it all comes together. I'm just showing you what the Bible says and what the Lord has revealed. It's very important to understand that. So the two people called the two, could be the two witnesses, are in, Israelites and Gentiles, and they stand before the Lord. They both are standing before the Lord, prophesying to the world for three and a half years. Now let's look at verse 7. It says, let's go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11, starting in verse 7. Look what it says. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. I don't know how that comes together. God hasn't revealed that yet. But this is what we do know is it's now talking about the beast. The beast. And isn't it interesting, right now, Revelation 13 is talking about the mark of the beast. And Revelation 14 talks about the mark of the beast. So this is what I do know. Like, I'll give you an example. We lead, I lead the Church of Philadelphia, based biblically, and I can give you many reasons why. And But I'm not the Church of Philadelphia. In other words, I'm not the entire Church of Philadelphia. There's people that are being baptized all around the world that God is bringing into the Church of Philadelphia. The Lord just showed some of the qualities of the Church of Philadelphia, and we started claiming it and teaching it first before anybody we could see and find on earth that we knew about and start teaching about the Sabbath day and the commandments and everything else. So I may lead the Church of Philadelphia, I'm representing the Church of Philadelphia, but I'm not the whole Church of Philadelphia. Very important to understand. But this is what the Bible says. It says, now when they finish their testimony. So my question was, well, when are they finishing their testimony? Well, it must be when the beast comes to attack them. That's what it says. The beast is now going to start attacking them. Well, if you read in Revelation 14, that's exactly what starts happening to the body of Christ. To the body of Christ in Revelation 14, verse 6, the mark of the beast comes and starts attacking the body of Christ, and they all have to be killed for their faith. And if you read Revelation 14, 6 through 9, or 6 through 14, it says, blessed are those who die in Christ from this point on, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, which would be part of the Church of Philadelphia somehow. You understand? But the first fruit are gone because Revelation 1 through 5, the first fruit are already in heaven. But that's exactly the time of this. So my question was to the Lord was, when is the end? When are we finishing our testimony? Well, we have to know if you're going to know when you finish the testimony, if that's Revelation 14, we got to count backwards. So we got to go from Revelation 14, which would be at Passover time in 2008. 22, if that were the case, based on that chart we looked at, if we go back 2021 Passover, 2020 Passover, 2019 Passover, 2018, half a year would be exactly at the Feast of Trumpets, 2018. Exactly at the Feast of Trumpets, 2018, would be exactly three and a half years. And it's interesting, and I want to share this with you guys. Um, in 2018, something interesting happened. 2017, I was in the hospital that year. 
And I was in the hospital, I think three or four times that year. After I came out, I almost died in 2017. My lungs almost collapsed, my kidneys almost collapsed. So that year I was getting back to recovery and I went to the hospital, I think one more time that year, later on that year. So that wasn't the year. The next year in 2018, something miraculous did something with our ministry with Save Our Truth. We started meeting brothers from India. We started meeting brothers from Africa. We started meeting brothers all around the world and God gave us some money that was donated to, you know, brother, you know, there was a motorcycle sold and we had some cash and we actually took that money and we spread the word of, of God around Facebook on, on, on Facebook. And what we would do is we would get on there with the brothers in India and Africa and we would do a lesson. I would do, teach it in English. They would translate it into their language. <clears throat> and then we would do that. You can see on our website, on our Save Right Truth website of when we did this, we did live videos and we did them over and over and over. They would drive from town to town and go to door to door. They would pull hundreds and hundreds of pastors together and do a live event. And we did that every day, the whole month of Feast of Trumpets month. And then on that Feast of Trumpets, we announced it and broadcasted it. And then that year, the Day of Atonement, we all prayed for the nations. And that's when it all launched. And that's when Saved by Truth Ministry went global. We went worldwide, not global, but we went worldwide. We started spreading this message around the world. In other words, we were prophesying the message of the kingdom of God for the first time, probably in years, with this true Sabbath day, the new moon celebration, the true meaning of the feast days, baptism for forgiveness of sin. And that's when we started teaching that message. I was teaching it. My wife was teaching it. We were all teaching it together. And it happened the first time on Feast of Trumpets in 2018. So if you think about it, Feast of Trumpets 2018 to the Passover 2019 was a half a year. That's 180 days. And then if you go from Passover 2019 to Passover 2020, that's another 360 days. Then if you go from Passover 2020 to 2021, that's 360 days. That's two years. And then if you go through uh, Passover 21 to Passover 2022, it's 360 days. That's exactly 1,260 days, exactly what the Bible says. That the two, two witnesses are going to be prophesying for 1,260 days, which is 300 you know, three and a half years, which is exactly when we did it. And then if you look, <clears throat> and this is what's so amazing, because last year the Lord did something special with us. He said, Stephen, at Passover, if people don't get the Passover, if they, people miss the Passover, you got to do a second Passover. You can read about that in Numbers 9 and Numbers 10. In Numbers 10, you can read about how they had to do a second Passover. And that was 30 days later. And so if you go 1,260 days and you add 30 more days, it equals 1,290 days. Well, I was like, well, God, well, how does 1,290 days, how does this clue into this? I don't understand. Well, he said, well, Stephen, if you understand what happened is 290 days, 1,290 days, if you look at that date, that was the exact day, the 17th, it's, it's between the 15th, 14th and the 21st day of the second month. Smack dab in the middle of that week is the exact day Noah left. And Noah actually left and got in the ark. I was like, what do you mean it was the exact same day? Well, if you go to Genesis, I think it's Genesis 7 or 8. One of those, Genesis 7 or 8, it talks about when Noah entered the ark and he was shut in by the Lord, the ark started flooding the earth on the 17th day of the second month. And I was like, really? Yeah, so we started looking at that. And that happens to be exactly around the 1290 days time period. But let me show you something here in scripture in Daniel. God showed me this this morning, Daniel 12. <clears throat> this was a prophecy years ago. Daniel 12 talks about the end times. So we now know the time period. It says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. Michael is a great angel. Remember the angels of the stars that protect the churches. Every, every single night, my son and I will go outside, my wife and I will go outside. There's two gigantic stars outside, two. And they're not gigantic. When I say gigantic, I'm talking about big, massive stars. One of them is bigger than the other. I have a feeling one of them is Michael and one of them is another one. And I don't remember the name, but I think it's either in this scripture or it's in, um, it's in nine. It's in Daniel nine, I think it is. 
but there's two angels that talks about protects the churches. Look what it says at that time. In other words, at the end times, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such has never happened from the beginning of the nations until then. Is that happening right now around the world? Is there a distress happening around the world that's never happened before? All these people getting this, this shot and this jab, all these people, their bodies are changing because they got the shot and the jab. Um, people can't buy or sell unless they take this jab. People are losing their jobs by the millions or quitting their jobs by the millions. The, 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 the ports are completely filled by the thousands of ships so people can't get food and the grocery stores are going to be empty. The gas prices are going through the roof. Even in California, we heard it's over $7 a gallon. It was $7 a gallon. You understand? In some places, in, one, in some areas. But you got to understand, have we ever seen a time like this before? The world's never seen anything like this. With technology growing and growing and knowledge increasing at the rate it's increasing? No, because look what it says. <clears throat> but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found in the book of life will be delivered. Well, delivered where? Will be delivered to the kingdom of God. It says multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. In other words, the dead in Christ will rise first, some to everlasting life and other to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever, <clears throat> will lead many to, uh, many to righteousness. What does that mean? Well, if you read in, de in, in the book of um, Deuteronomy 6, I think it's verse 24, it says righteousness is keeping the commandments. So who's leading people to keep the commandments? The Church of Philadelphia is. See what truth ministry is. It says, but you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Look what it says. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Knowledge has never increased as much as it has in the last 20, 30 years. Never in the history of mankind. You take all of mankind history up into 20 years ago, from 20 years to now, the knowledge has increased a thousand times all versus all of history. So we now know it's talking about the last days. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others on the bank of the river and one on opposite banks. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the water and the rivers, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen was above the water of the river, lifted his right hand and his left towards the heaven. I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, time and half a time, three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? The same exact thing we've just been showing. From the power of the holy people has finally been broken all these things will be completed. Three and a half years is the exact same three and a half years Jesus died and was buried and was resurrected. Well, he, that was three days. Actually, that's not the same. But three and a half years is the time the, the two witnesses have been prophesying. I heard, but did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And that's why I share with you guys. I hope you pray that you're understanding this message. Because it says the wise will be purified, made spotless. They're going to be refined. And that's why it would say by truth ministry, we've been talking about purify yourself, refine yourself. We've been talking about that. If you have any unconfessed sin, get it out because you need to be purified for the Lord. Look what it says. From that time, the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up. There'll be 1,290 days. Wow. Now, I don't know what happened around the Feast of Trumpets uh, with this virus thingy that's going on around the world. But I do know it launched in 2019. They couldn't have possibly discovered it back then because they were already planning it before that. I have a feeling something around in 2018, right around this time, the abomination that causes desolation was set up during that time. 
I don't think it was released until 2019, but it was set up before that. I'm almost positive. I'm sure in the next Bible study, God will reveal that it was. And I hope you guys all pray and do some study on this and look for it, because I guarantee it was revealed then, because the abomination that causes desolation, what does desolation mean? In other words, people die. That causes people to de be desolate. The lands be desolate. Well, what's the only thing that can cause that kind of desolation? Not even a nuclear bomb could do that. But this thing that people are getting put in their body will, when there's millions and millions of people have taken it or billions of people have taken it. See, and there will be, it'll be there till 1290 days. See, 1290 days, that's actually right when that second Passover is. Isn't that interesting? Right as the days of Noah. But then it says also, blessed are the ones who wait for and reaches the end of the 335 days. I don't know how that ties in. But what I do know is Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, the 144,000 are gone. And that's three and a half years plus one month, exact time frame, which would be exactly the time Noah's ark, Noah entered the ark and was shut in. 335 days is a few, about 45 days later. I don't know exactly what that time frame is, but if you read Revelation 14, verses 6 through 9, it says, blessed are the dead who die from this point on. And that's maybe who these people are. These may be the the harvest, the great harvest, and it happens to be right after the Feast of Harvest. So I'm just telling you, I don't know the answers to all this. What I'm doing is what God has revealed to me last night and today, prophesying to share this message with you, and prayerfully, you'll get some insights. Prayerfully, the Lord will share some of these things with you. I don't know, but I'm just sharing with you what the Lord will share with me up to this point. Look what it says. As for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of our days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. This message was about the two witnesses of the Lord in the book of Revelation, but it's really only for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear that will hear this message, which are the true body of Christ and the disciples of Jesus. Let's end this off in prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this message. Thank you so much for Revelation, gosh. It's so inspiring, God. And I just pray that you show us in detail in our hearts of who those two witnesses are and how they are playing the part today. I know you've shown how we've we've played our part and, and, and what we've done over these years, but God, please, please make it clear for all of us so we have no doubt, God, of, of what we need to do from this point to purify ourselves so we can make it to the kingdom of God. I pray this message can go around the world. I pray people will be inspired. I pray more people will get their sins forgiven and start to broadcast this message around the world so just that one more soul can be saved. We love you. We thank you so much for this time. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.